The next speaker, it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Anderson from uh, Robert Wood Johnson. Uh, Mark is a true believer in re recovery, has excellent results, is, and his site is one of the uh, uh, champion sites for recovery, uh, and uh, we learn a lot from him as well. Mark? Thank you, Kareem. It's a pleasure to be here this evening and an honor to be included amongst the uh, panel of distinguished speakers. I'd like to thank the people at Abimed for putting this together and, and inviting me. Uh, I think that this is really a testimony to what the people at uh, Mike and Kareem and the rest of the great people at Abimed uh, are doing. They are, are truly committed to the concept and uh, are committed to the, the transfer of this concept and the education, but they're also committed to the technology and most importantly to, the, to improving patient outcomes. And, and it, for me, it's really a, a pleasure to be a part of this. Uh, I'm sure most of you uh, now are getting a, becoming familiar with the fact that there's a lot of technology out there. And, uh, we, we've come a long way, and, and it's really exciting to see now, as if you heard about the Impella, we're kind of going backwards in terms of our, uh, not in, our, in terms of our ability to support patients, but the invasive nature of the technology, and it seems to be getting better day by day, but it has become confusing, and, and it's hard to figure out kind of where we're at, so hopefully I'll, I'll be able to shed, <laughs> shed some, some, some light on that tonight. Dr. Cormos uh, mentioned this, and I think this is the, the primary th thrust of what we're talking about tonight, is that there has to be a paradigm shift. And, and most of us uh, who have been transplanters for many years and, and really been firm believer, believers in transplantation and were taught to think that there was no, nothing else than transplantation have really had to think uh, long and hard about this paradigm shift. But it, it is really time for us to to shift from what we thought was the truth uh, to what is currently really reality, and that is that uh, circulatory support should, in, in most situations, and we're talking about acute situations, acute myocardial infarction in specific, or any other acute situation which is resulting in cardiogenic shock, that circulatory sh support should be viewed as a bridge to recovery. I want to talk a bit about uh, tonight about acute myocardial infarction. A lot of uh, physicians that I see say, well, gee, you know, we'd like to start a um, transplant or a VAD program, and, but we can't seem to get started. Our cardiac surgery program, we do a couple hundred cases a year. We see one or two VADs. They don't do well. Uh, we're just, we, we can't get started, and I think we should just leave it to the bigger centers, to the transplant centers, and... and and I, we just um, have, have not had a good experience. Well, I disagree with that in, entirely. And I think it, it's, it's really because that the majority of cardiac surgeons have not ventured out beyond the cardiac surgical operating room, especially if you're not a, um, a, a transplant surgeon. If you look at some of the data here, um, and this is, is data which, which may be underestimating, actually, the, the real true numbers. Acute MI is probably higher than that. Uh, it's probably a million acute myocardial infarctions a year or even more. So if you look at the numbers, there are a lot of potential patients out there that we can treat with circulatory support. The reality is, is when they say that we're not seeing much from the cardiac surgical operating room, that's true. We aren't, and that's because we've gotten better. And the fact that we're not seeing that many patients come out of the cardiac surgical operating room on support anymore. But there are patients out there that are going to need cardio, uh, sh uh, support for cardiogenic shock. And if you look at this, there's 20,000 potential patients in the United States this year. I'm going to show you some data on a, a series of 100 patients. And that's one of the largest series out there in the literature. So clearly there's a disconnect. And I think one of the great things about a program like this this evening is that we can we can kind of spread the word and get the, uh, the, the data out there and the concept out there that there are patients that need to be treated, they're being undertreated, and we can improve their outcomes. So how are we traditionally treating these patients? This is some data from, from Lou Samuels, who's been a long, uh, long been a pioneer of this concept of, of circulatory support, bridge to recovery. This is some data of his from, from postcardiotomy patients, but I certainly would argue that it's transferable to any patient that's in cardiogenic shock. 
patients that are, are going from the, from the no inotrope, getting sicker and sicker, to the multi-inotrope, high-dose inotrope, obviously mortality uh, is increasing. So the, the point is, how are we treating these patients? Historically, we've uh, often left them on their own and left them on, on the inotropic therapy, and the outcomes are as you see. Now, fortunately, we do have a spectrum that we're able to take care of and treat these patients that offer them, depending on the severity of their illness, um, different types of therapy, therapy to improve their outcomes. Obviously, the patient on the low-dose inotrope with, with uh, stable hemodynamics is not a patient that requires full support with the AB5000. On the other hand, as you increase in severity in terms of hemodynamic disturbance, it's really nice now that we have the spectrum to treat these patients. Going from the balloon pump to the impella that you've heard uh, now for the short-term moderate uh, impairment of hemodynamic uh, parameters to full support with the AB5000 for the uh, uh, very sick patient. Uh, put another way, this is, uh, again, to talk about the spectrum and a little bit about the diagnoses. I, I think, I, I don't want to just mention that it's acute myocardial infarction. I think we've been uh, touched upon it already a couple times tonight that it's really anybody with acute myocardial dysfunction and, and cardiogenic shock. But I, I think it's very important to get through the concept of the, um, the spectrum of approach to these patients, the stepwise approach to these patients, and really the conscious decision making in taking care of these patients. Certainly there's a lot of different diagnoses that are uh, potentially treatable with inotropic therapy, but the point is, is to take the data that I just showed you about outcomes treating these patients with a, either just inotropes or inotropes and a balloon and, and try to alter this outcome in terms of both survival uh, and uh, recovery of native ventricular function, but to go through the stepwise process of treating these patients, uh, assessing them, and then moving forward in terms of the spectrum of uh, therapeutics, whether it's the intraortic balloon pump, moving on to the impella, or going on to the uh, more complete circulatory assist with, or long-term uh, circulatory assist with the AB5000 and the BVS5000. So clearly one thing we have learned, and I think that everybody would at this uh, panel would agree to, that early intervention increases the probability of survival in these patients. And it's a, it's a question or it's a point that somehow does not seem to get across. And, and, and it's, we've been driving this message home for the past 10 years, and it still doesn't seem to get across that timing is critical in terms of implantation of circulatory support for either the post-cardiotomy patient or the, uh, any other acute uh, cardiogenic shock uh, patient. I do think that you have a little bit more leeway in, in the um, myocardial infarction or the myocarditis patient as opposed to the post-cardiotomy patient, but clearly timing remains uh, critical. So we're talking about getting, um, getting programs going or, or, or addressing these patients. How, how, how can we do it? We're not seeing that. I said there's 20,000 patients out there, but we have a series of 100 patients. What, what, what's happening? So how, how have we identified more patients? Well, this is an example of our protocol to try to get into the loop of the patients with acute myocardial infarction and, and become part of the algorithm in their management. I wouldn't say that we have been 100% universally uh, successful in this, but it has been a step forward in terms of developing the program uh, for the treatment of acute myocardial infarction. But I think what's going to be more exciting and what you've heard about already is, is the spectrum of support. Abiomed has now introduced an intraortic balloon pump. You've heard about the data with the impella and now I'm going to show you some data with the AB5000. But I think as a surgeon, how we're going to become involved in these patients and really have a, a bigger impact as is as the impella becomes more important. The, the balloon we already know, but the impella becomes more important in the treatment of these patients. As these patients are treated in the cath lab with either the 2.5 or the 5.0, I think the surgeons are going to become uh, obviously by necessity more involved in the management of these patients. And I think we're going to have uh, the spectrum of care for these patients and we're going to see an, uh, certainly an increase in the number of uh, patients seen for uh, circulatory support. And I think the staging and the spectrum of therapy is, is a really 
a really critical concept in the management of these patients. We've heard a lot about the technologies tonight, the Impella. I won't go over a lot uh, of the AB5000 technology. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, or most of you are certainly familiar with the BVS5000, which I think has been around for 10 plus years. The AB5000 was really the, the necessary step forward for this technology for Abiumed. They really, uh, from my point of view, addressed the shortcomings of the BVS5000, and, and certainly in our program, the BVS 5000 has, has, has fallen by the wayside. Now, what I say the BVS 5000 is obsolete, no, but I think now also with the Impella, the BVS 5000 is going to, going to have a, uh, I think a, um, the significant role is, is certainly going to be diminished now that we are, are going to have the feasibility of the Impella and the AB 5000. AB 5000 fantastic technology works extremely well, but I, I, I won't belabor the technology. You've seen this slide. I only want to mention again the spectrum of support, and I really want to drive home that the spectrum of support is, is extremely important because it really begins, it initiates the management of these patients um, from the very beginning with the balloon pump and on, on to the um, AB5000, and Abiumet is the only uh, company out there that has this spectrum. And I, I think, again, it, it demonstrates their commitment to the management of these patients. Um, we had heard about the Impel, and unless, this may not look lesser invasive to you, um, but it does to me as a, cardiac, <laughs> as a cardiac surgeon for a patient that was a multi-redo patient. I, I, and Dr. Cormo suggested that we need to address a less invasive approach for more advanced support. Now, clearly, the Impella is a less invasive technology. The AB5000 has not been billed as a less invasive technology, but I think we're getting there, that we have the less invasive. This is a patient that was a multi-redo patient that needed um, biventricular support that I addressed the right side through a small right anterior thoracotomy in about the fourth intercostal space and the left side through a small left anterior thoracotomy in the sixth intercostal space and was able to um, not enter this guy's chest for the third time, uh, which I think really would have been prohibitive. But I think these are, are needs that we're, we're starting to meet. There's a lesser, a minimally invasive cannula that's going to hopefully um, allow us to uh, implant full uh, medium to long-term support in a less invasive uh, approach in the future. I just want to mention briefly that I, I'm a firm believer in biventricular support and, and the one beauty of, of getting to the um, AB5000 and, and, and the more complete uh, support is the ability to do that as opposed to um, the interiotic balloon or the impella. Um, there is, I, I truly believe there is a difference in outcomes in the patients. I mean, there's clearly the patients that only need left-sided support, but there's also a large number of patients that are on the fence, and I think to have a low threshold to go ahead with biventricular support is extremely important, and this is just some data to suggest that the outcomes are markedly different with biventricular support for obvious reasons in terms of completely resting the heart and eliminating inotropic needs and, and stability with arrhythmias. So, the question that I'm going to arrive at finally is, is can we improve the outcomes in AMI cardiogenic shock? Well, we, you are in luck. I happen to have some data uh, with regard to that. This is a paper that I was able to present at the TCT earlier this year, which the, the really good thing about that was that that was a room full of cardiologists, which, which is always a scary prospect, but on the other hand, an extremely important point or an important opportunity because those are still obviously the gatekeepers of the patients and those are the, the, the people that we really need to get the message through to that we can impact these patients. This was uh, an update uh, of uh, some data that uh, we had been accumulating. Uh, it was, the first data we had 50 patients, now this is an updated 100 uh, patients, a bunch of centers around the country. Basically, all comers uh, were accepted into the database, and these were patients that were implanted with the AB5000, patients with acute cardiogenic shock from myocardial infarction. 
as you can see, that we retrospectively looked at the data and, and survival was looked at at 30 days, but recovery, importantly, was considered as unassisted native cardiac function. The patients broke down basically as you would expect. Um, most of them were revascularized, almost all of them, as you can see, 93% of these patients uh, were revascularized. You can see how the revascularization is broken down. Kind of the, uh, they were sick, clearly, with uh, low EFs. Um, really an interesting and important data that kind of supports the fact that I was saying how the, the timing concept hasn't come through yet, uh, that uh, over half of these patients were in shock for over 24 hours, and this is kind of the same thing you get from from most physicians you talk to in terms of, I get referred to patients, they're three quarters dead or you know nine tenths dead when I get them. And it's true, it's still reflected in this. And, and this is one of the, the points that we're hoping to certainly, uh, I, I think, drive home uh, tonight, that it's really hard to have good outcomes in this type of scenario. Again, on, as a follow-up to that, the patients were quite ill. As you can see, most of them were on inotropes and um, had a balloon getting, uh, half of them getting CPR, a very sick patient population. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of the management of them, about 50-50 in terms of BIVAD and LVAD, which again I think is very important because I am a firm believer in BIVAD support. And a lot of these patients were uh, transferred from outside institutions and then transitioned to the AB5000 from the BVS5000. There's no doubt in my mind, or, or should be any, a doubt in anybody's mind, in terms of the efficacy of, of the AB5000 in terms of hemodynamics. You can see the difference between the uh, pre-implantation and post-implantation hemodynamics, and then you can see the, the post-explantation hemodynamics in the patients that survived in terms of the uh, maintenance of, of cardiac function and normal hemodynamics once uh, the patients were explanted. And obviously, here's the, the bottom line in terms of the patients that were uh, survivors, two-thirds of them were able to recover their uh, cardiac function. Uh, the other very important point of this slide is that the average recovery time was 25 days. And this was, this was surprising and, and not, had not been my practice, quite honestly. My practice had been starting to look for recovery in the one-week range and, and looking to explant patients or think about transplantation if, if I didn't see it, but it's clearly not the case, and, and it's, it's uh, caused us to really truly reassess how we're managing these patients and how we're thinking about these patients because the data is suggesting that recovery is occurring a lot later than we had initially thought. One of the criticisms of the, of the review was that, you know, are these patients really sick enough? You got two-thirds of the patients to recover, um, are they really sick enough? Are you, are, is this, these patients would have survived anyway? Well, we just, we looked at the shock trial data. We looked at the shock trial database and, and we compared the patients in the shock trial who died to the patients in this study that survived. And, and obvious, for obvious reasons, you can compare to look and see if these patients were truly sick enough. And the bottom line was, in fact, the patients that survived and recovered were sicker than the patients who died in the shock trial. So it certainly validated the, the data that recovery is feasible. Um, just to mention, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of centers that have um, the BVS 5000 in particular or put devices in and then ship them off often think, well, you know, we ship them off to another institution and they get transplanted and they, they um, nobody really knows about the follow-up of these patients, and often um, it, they just kind of, uh, the patients are lost to follow-up. But we wanted to look at what's happening to the patients, in specific what are happening to the patients who are transferred from outside institutions and then converted to the AB5000. The, the, one of the beauties of the AB5000 uh, is that the conversion from the BVS to the AB5000 can be done very quickly and does not require a reoperation. And having done this multiple times at the bedside, um, I can uh, certainly uh, attest to the fact that it is, it is a big difference from being able to do this at the bedside versus taking somebody back to the operating room and having to reopen the chest, perhaps go back on bypass. Uh, a big difference in terms of hoping to or, or reducing uh, complications. 
in terms of the outcomes of the, pa the patients that were converted from the BVS to the AV5000, you can again see that um, recovery was uh, the primary outcome in terms of the, of the survivors. Now, again, I wouldn't, uh, and, and this is comparing a, uh, a study from Mike Acker's group at Penn of patients that were transferred in from the outside, and, and this kind of supports the concept that all these patients uh, were going, uh, transferred in and they just get transplanted. And you can see here, I didn't put it down, but the, the time to transplant in that group is shorter than the time to recovery. The concept being is that, again, we're not understanding the fact that recovery is occurring later and these patients are being transplanted before they're given the opportunity uh, to recover. But again, it's still the fact that the paradigm shift hasn't occurred and uh, the opportunity for recovery has not occurred. And <clears throat> with regard to that, this, this just uh, supports the fact that the, uh, the AB5000 in particular, most of us who started with the BVS5000, and, and one of the, uh, uh, although the BVS5000 excellent technology, it, it still was um, a problem in terms of medium-term support. And now with the AB5000, medium-term support is, is a reality, and we're able to support these patients longer, and you can see from the data here that um, the average time of support, again, is long, much longer than I, I've ever, ever imagined. And so it's really caused me to uh, relook at how we're managing these patients. So that comes up with the, the question of how are we assessing these patients for recovery? And, and I think it's, it's going to be a very uh, exciting area for further study because we had historically just been using a transthoracic uh, echo, but I'm not sure that that is appropriate. Uh, what can we use? Well, you can look at enzymes, you can look at other markers, but most of these normalize early on because the patients are on support. Is uh, Swangans catheter and cardiac output uh, appropriate? I heard um, Jerry Buckberg once say uh, the, the septum tells all, so should we do an endomyocardial biopsy? I don't know, but I, and I think this is a very good and exciting area for research to try to, to really be able to identify when recovery has occurred and when we should explant these patients, and hopefully we'll have some more answers uh, in this regard in the future. So in conclusion, it's, I think you should see from the, the preceding uh, talks you've had in this one that ventricular function is recoverable and, and the paradigm shift has to occur to one of uh, a bridge to recovery. I would never say that <clears throat> uh, revascularization uh, is not important and I do think that total support, as I mentioned, especially with biventricular support in the, in the quite sick patients is extremely important. Delayed implant uh, is a problem and, and does impair recovery uh, in, in terms of outcomes. And that recovery uh, does take longer than we thought, and we're going to need a better way uh, to assess it. And I don't see any reason why these patients, once recovered, uh, shouldn't go on uh, to continue to enjoy recovery uh, for an extended uh, period of time. Thank you very much. Thank you.